Anthony. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. Nice to meet you. During the pandemic, we met socially distanced in our studios here in Washington, D.C., a city where one in every seven residents is an immigrant. Since 2017, roughly 14% of D.C.'s population was born in other countries. That's according to the American Immigration Council. In the D.C. area, close to 300,000 residents come from El Salvador or other regions of Central America, where criminal activity contributes to the massive exodus. In a um, series of interviews I did with a young man named Andy, 17 years old, um, who is a uh, member of the Mata Salvatrucha MS-13 gang, the probably most feared gang um, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, and had become a, a protected witness for the Guatemalan government and uh, was there providing background information on some of the most sort of spectacular acts of terror that the gang had, uh, had enacted in um, uh, uh, by this crime where four people, four people were de decapitated and their heads left around the city. Anyway, in interviewing Andy, I, I, uh, I asked him, you know, he, one of the questions he asked me was like, was like, what can you give me? You know, what, what can you promise me? Why should, I, why should I give you any information? I was like, I can't give you anything, except I can try to tell your story far from these streets where you see so many people like yourself die, right? And he had no illusions about what was going to happen to him. He was 17. He knew that sooner or later his past would catch up with him, and he was going to die the way he'd seen so many people die, um, young and, and, and violently. And so my promise of this sort of poor kind of immortality, right, um, of, of a promise to at least try to tell his side of the story um, and give him a life beyond the life that he knew um, uh, that, he, that he already had was enough. Um, and this is enough over, again and again, that sentiment comes through. What does that transactional quality tell you about his life, though? I mean, it says something, doesn't it? That you learn to survive in ways that we would never understand. If you were a 15-year-old young man or woman living in a gang-controlled territory in, um, in, in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, you know perfectly well who has the power in your, in your neighborhood. And so you have a choice. You can either try to join the gang and become pa part of that power structure and part of the violence that entails, um, or you can try to survive by staying at the margins, having a friend in there who might speak for you, um, staying connected but not getting involved, um, uh, finding some way to survive within that system. Anthony Fontes is an assistant professor at American University School of International Service. He holds a PhD in human geography from the University of California, Berkeley. Fontes spent nearly a decade doing research in Central America, which led to the publication of Mortal Doubt. Let's start with uh, the book and your interest in writing it and the difficulty of, of writing this story, because you really have to kind of, you can't just get it out of a newspaper. You have to kind of live it. I wanted it to get out into the, into the world. Um, and I wanted to understand as well as I could and communicate as well as I could the underlying conditions driving the violence and extreme insecurity that are, are in a sense one of the root causes, one of the major root causes for why people are fleeing Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and, uh, and El Salvador. The process of doing so was essentially trying to find what we call in the trade gatekeepers. Right? Trying to find people who, in a sense, straddled the line between legal and illegal, who have connections on both sides of the law, who would it's, be willing to open some of these doors uh, to me so that I could actually um, gain the trust and, um, uh, of, of people who are involved in this life of being a gangster, of being, um, uh, uh, being an outlaw of some kind or another. The Northern Triangle of Central America, composed of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, is considered one of the most dangerous places on the planet, according to the United Nations. Families in this region are often extorted and persecuted by the notorious gangs who operate here. You talk about kind of the different faces of gangs. Talk to us about that. Well, there's, you know, the face that has become globally public, right? The face that, you know, if you ask a, a, a eighth, eighth grader who, what a gangster looks like, they'll tell you he's got a tatted face, he's got, uh, you know, teardrops at the eye, he's leering at you from out between, you know, uh, uh, 
prison uh, uh, bars or what have you. And then, you know, you have that, and that's a face that is embraced, but it's just one of many faces. They really started out, in some sense, as private security for the poor. The way it was explained to me at the, at the very beginning, you're living in a neighborhood where robbers are stealing out of, out from people on their front stoops. You get, the gang comes in and says, okay, you know, you give us a monthly stipend, and we'll put a guy on your corner, and this won't happen. So it tracks essentially with, at the same time, rich corp, rich companies, anyone who can afford it, at the same, because of this rampant insecurity, are are investing in private security corporations. Mm. In this part of the world, private security corporations have grown something like five thousand percent in the last twenty years. Jeez. It is the biggest growth industry in the region. Um, and there are something like four times as many private security guards as there are actual policemen paid by the government, right? Wow. Um, and so, in that sense, the poor were just trying to get by in the same way that everybody else was. What they morph into, though, and this is a problem with protection rackets the world over, is that, that that promise of protection eventually becomes, we'll protect you from us, right? So it's that, in, and we, you know, you pay us to protect you from those other guys, but also from us. And so extortion rackets morph from that private security for the poor to essentially um, uh, these organizations staffed by poor people feeding on their fellow poor. During the 1980s, a civil war led to a wave of immigrants escaping from El Salvador. Many settled in Los Angeles. They fell victim to racism by other Hispanic communities, in particular to a Mexican group known as Barrio 18, or the 18th Street Gang. In order to defend themselves, they formed a power group, which today is known as Mara Salvatrucha, or MS-13. Since then, many members have been deported back, starting new chapters of the gang, not only across Central America, but throughout the world. MS-13 actually started here in the United States. Absolutely. And the shocking thing is, and, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't, hadn't even really realized that, uh, you know, I've read this article about Milan in Europe. How does it end up in Italy? That's a very good question. Um, it tags back to flows of migration, right? So the, now that these gangs have become so established in these particular countries, um, and the MS-13 will fo can follow any migration patterns. So any country that, that, uh, that Central American migrants end up in, um, there's a possibility of this, of this sort of uh, recapitulation of MS-13 and they're being able to dig, um, uh, to root themselves in these Central American communities. But I want to caution against thinking of migrants as a sort of um, vanguard for MS-13 because th these gangs travel as much through their symbolic, um, the, sim the spectacle they make as they do through the sort of movement of actual bodies. And what I mean by that is they're a brand now, the same way that McDonald's is a brand, right? I've seen MS-13, I see all over here in Washington, D.C., you see MS-13 um, uh, graffiti, you see, and you see kids reproducing the image without actually having an understanding of what it is, right? So putting MS-13 graffiti on a, on a wall or in their, um, in their school notebook and because of how hyper paranoid and how uh, the, 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 the state, you know, we're talking the US state or any other state, is to this gang phenomenon, and because of how much they mistake the symbols for the actual uh, uh, organization, people see MS-13 everywhere. So in that sense, the, 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 the gang itself is, is not as big or as far-reaching or as powerful or as organized as, um, you know, on a transnational level as, as uh, the FBI and security hawks would like you to think they are. Um, so in that sense, for instance, the, the, in, the transnational connections, we, it, it's a mistake to think of them as some sort of, there's like a one guy in control, he's sitting in a Salvadoran prison and he's sending his orders out to Milan. Not at all, right? These are gangs that are using that brand because they know that brand will invoke terror 
in their uh, in their in their victim and, in, and for a larger audience. Um, and so the the connections are connections of culture, but not of connections of some transnational organization, like, like we come to think of the mafia or other very powerful organized criminal groups that operate on a global level. These guys are the lowest end of the totem pole in terms of, of criminal economies and illicit networks um, and aren't about to, um, uh, th th their, their growth is not determined by some big strategic plan, but more the spreading of the brand itself. During his time in Central America, Fontes volunteered at a local prison as a photographer. He helped organize arts and crafts workshops and barbecues. He even played basketball with the inmates. They started to open up and understand who he was and his reasons for being there. This is, this is a fascinating picture. I mean, you captured a lot here with this, his eyes and, you know, and of course the tattoo and then, right. but the, well, it's a kid's stuff, right? This kid's like 19. He's in for double murder, 50 years. He's never getting out. He's got this typical tattooed face of a gangster. And then you have, you know, the, the, the nudie pictures in the background. But then you have all these toys that he keeps for his kid's visit. And I think even more what strikes me is this self-portrait that he made yeah. of himself and his, his four-year-old daughter in that, right, you... His face, is, he's kind of reproducing the same sort of image of the gangster of himself, but the girl has this amazing humanity to her. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's beautifully done and speaks to those ties that bind us to the better angels of our being, right? Yeah. That no matter what you've done, you can, you know, that you're still human with the same sort of bonds of affection that a human will have. There's another picture from the isolation block in, in a, a Guatemala prison, another gang member and with his daughter on visiting day. And taking photographs actually became a way of giving something back because these are guys that, again, giving them a place so I could take photographs and say, okay, next time I come, I will give you these photographs. You can give it to your family. The guys would circulate it out to get girls to come visit them. Mm -hmm. You know, it became a way of, of both giving something and having some sort of currency, um, but also very valuable, of course, as research materials. I love this one, too. Yeah, this one, in terms of this is an isolation block, and it captures some of that sort of, you know, these guys are adept at playing at that, the scary gangster, right? The image of the gangster, the image of that they're supposed to fulfill becomes a sort of a role that they play. It's interesting, conversations with these guys that, that I remember a, a good friend of mine, a guy named Pancho, who is since released from prison. He asked me one time, he's like, who do you think the coldest guys in prison are, the most dangerous, the ones that everyone else is afraid of. And I was like, gangsters, murderers? He's like, no, no, no. Kidnappers. Kidnappers are the most dangerous. I was like, why? He's like, well, because they are willing to pr prolong pain, to apply pressure by kidnapping someone and then asking for ransom to a whole family over a long period of time, right? And to sustain it in a cold, and, and, and consistent manner. These are, you know, literally probably the one most likely to be a sociopath is uh, willing to sort of totally disregard others, the suffering of another human being as a kidnapper. Wow. The COVID-19 pandemic actually empowered the gangs. Restrictions and lockdowns allowed them to control the flow of food and medicine into certain areas. Unable to trust local authorities, residents don't know where to turn to for help, forcing them to embark on the dangerous migration trails. Sexual violence and femicide are also a big problem. In Honduras, the mother is more discriminated, more as she is alone, everyone says, You've uh, done the migration trails. I mean, this is not, uh, it's not a walk in the park, uh, making that journey. So in order to make that journey, you have to be pretty desperate. Uh, describe it for us and what's it like? Um, so yeah, I'll never forget a, uh, a, a, a young man I interviewed on the migration trail, you know, uh, moving through the southern part of Mexico, I, I asked him this question. It's like, why are you doing this? You know this is very dangerous. 
what, you know, what's driving you? And, and he, said, he said, look, I know this is dangerous, but my country is like a cage. And I, this journey to the U.S. is a long, dark tunnel, but at least there's a, there, there's a light at the end of it. Um, and I think that sense of, for lack of a better word, hopelessness that pervades the uh, sense of, of possibilities for youth, poor youth growing up in spaces dominated by gangs or just in, in deep poverty in a place where social mobility is, is practically non-existent. Uh, the U.S. still has that sort of beacon of freedom, beacon of hope I idea that at least prosperity is possible here. Security is possible. So for people who see no way out in their society, um, in their particular community, the U.S. holds out that hope. And whatever risk they might, uh, they, they might have to take going through the, the, the desert in Mexico, navigating the variety of both criminal and state entities that are, are trying to hunt them, uh, hurt them in some way or another, um, it's worth it because it's temporary and there is a sense of hope at the end of it, no matter how thin and fading that hope might be. Now, in terms of actual conditions, I was, you know, I can only claim to have done bits and pieces of it um, and to have uh, uh, experienced, you know, I would go through and stay in the same towns that migrants were staying, but I'd stay in a hotel, right? Um, what struck me was, again, the sense, you know, waiting out by the train, the sense of extreme insecurity because kidnap, the, the, the levels of kidnappings, ransomings, extortions, um, uh, in terms of for for uh, uh, for female migrants, levels of sexual abuse are somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of women experience some sort of uh, sexual abuse along the migration trail. It's astonishing. So you're almost it's it's almost certain that you will be victimized along the way. It's just a question of when. So that same sense of extreme insecurity that drives so many immigrants to. Uh, so many migrants to try the journey in the first place haunts the journey from start to finish, um, and uh, is is in a sense has only gotten has gotten much much worse over the last decade as U.S. has pushed Mexico to make things as hard as possible, as difficult as possible for migrants before they get to the actual Rio Grande on the U.S. southern border. Immigration is perhaps the most polarizing issue in U.S. politics. Trump referred to immigration laws as broken. He promised to build a wall and lower the number of asylum grants. Many of his policies have been reversed by President Biden. And those new policies, along with the pandemic, are causing millions of backlogs in applications, allowing human smuggling groups to take advantage of the situation by selling the idea that now is the time to cross the border into the U.S. There is a, a constant sort of dance between uh, uh, smuggling organizations that help essentially assist people um, from Central America to make it, to, to navigate Mexico and then to navigate um, the uh, the U.S. southern border, uh, and they their work like any good corporation is it all depends they have material goods that they are selling this 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 journey and again, safety and security and some sense of certainty that one will arrive at one's destination. But they also work to amp up um, and create desire for their product. And they do that by, in some cases, spreading rumors or working off the play of US, US immigration politics to say, now is the time to go. So what we saw, for instance, in the run-up to uh, um, Trump taking office, because of his incredibly his, his, his anti-immigrant uh, 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 rhetoric, how um, virulent it was, how powerful, how, how much he promised to shut down the border, you see a rise in immigration during that time because the coyotes are telling migrants, potential migrants, look, you got to go now, you got to go now. This is the time. Um, and I think something of the same of, of the same process is happening. Um, today as well, in the sense that you know this idea that Biden is going to pull back some of the restrictions uh, of the Trump administration also is something that smuggling networks can use to encourage people to go. At the same time, ironically, perhaps, the more state enforcement there is, the higher coyote networks can charge their clients, right? So the price of the trip from Guatemala to the Rio Grande, the U.S. border, uh, 10 years ago was something around $2,500 to $3,000. That's how much you paid per head to, um, to, uh, to, to get from, from point A to point B. Today, it's probably between eight and $10,000, 
right? And that is almost entirely due to how much more dangerous and difficult that journey has become and uh, in major part because of how much more enforcement the Mexican immigration authorities are doing at the behest of the United States. So in a sense, the, more, the, the higher state enforcement against, uh, against immigration goes up, the more lucrative the business of, of, of migrant smuggling is, the more powerful these organizations become. And I think in the long run, if we can begin to think of um, the, the ties that bind Central America, United States, and think of these not as separate spaces, but spaces that are connected by culture, by uh, economies, by um, you know, hopes and desires and dreams for people to have a better life, then we can begin to actually think of a more uh, humane way and an effective way to actually deal with the problems that come out of that relationship. Thanks so much. This is a great conversation. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. My pleasure.